is the events industry moving with digital times, essentially, and, and could it be doing a better job? Uh, now, I want to not dive too much into marketing because we've got a whole section on that, Ricardo, but, but do you think, in general, the events industry is, is moving with the digital times? No, I, I think um, that's really, really hard. The, the, the events, event organizers think that digital is email, um, and that's not the case. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that's the, the, the long term. It's a long way to catch up. And, uh, and even if they say they're going to digital, they don't they just say, oh, we're going to go to Twitter, we're going to do, or we're going to do X, Y, Z, and then, but it's, it's, it's just not, it's not, in my opinion, it's not good enough. Um, everyone says that they're going to do, they, they also think that digital is, is having an event app. That's not, that's not really, so I think there's a lot to catch up with that. Okay, and and Paul, do you think? I know it's a very meta question, but do, do you think we are at a point where the you know we've embraced digital enough as an industry? Well, I've seen sectors where where it's worse, to be honest. <laughs> but given that we are a creative sector, and um, probably you know, Ricardo about his experience there, but um, it, it's clear that the voices that are the strongest in the industry in terms of. Uh, uh, discussions and, and uh, blue sky thinking are the people who, who do get out there on the digital platforms and um, you know you know, event across hash and all the all the different uh, you know industry forms of all the digital debate and you can see that that uh, those people's opinions you know they're crunched by the way so the organizers need to use all of these channels um, uh, increasingly because you're it's all about perception and you can have some very um, those uh, small organisers who, who who pack a big punch, and it's all thanks to the way they use those digital platforms. And, and Alistair, from your perspective, maybe from a venue perspective, but also what you see from, from your organisers here is it you know are, are we are we pushing digital or are we, are we behind the curve? Well, I, I'm not sure what this question is, but I mean, in terms of um, what I see going on, I think in venues, uh, let's think of some examples. We've been trialling iBeacons. Uh, we've seen anybody else trial iBeacons in their venue? So iBeacons is a technology that allows people to use their phone and GPS to go and meet other delegates. Um, I've seen um, badges that we're all wearing where you touch the, um, the badge and you exchange business cards as opposed to the, the old fashioned way of doing it. Uh, things like Slivu, I'm seeing more in terms of getting audience engagement and participation. I'm not sure of that. I went to see a conference venue the other day where they were doing hologram speakers, which I thought was unbelievably uh, clever piece of technology. Um, of course, for venues, the great threat of digital is that people will stop doing face-to-face -face and they'll they'll start attending digitally or virtually. If that's the case, and I think that's <coughs> still very very slow progress um, in this country. There's still some potential. I just wanted to add as well that digital is such a big, such a big word. So is it is it going digital to to reach your audiences? Is it digital to to use you know all the technology that's available, or is it digital to enable the user to interact more with you or or with or with the panel? I I really just think that using digital to for, for all of us to interact here is is not needed personally because the easiest way is just just to raise your hand and ask your question. Easy. You don't really need to log on and everything, but um, but yeah, it's. I think if, if the person that answers that asks the question, if they can be a bit more specific, it will it will help us answer that in a more objective way. Because digital is. We, we're getting be... into more specific topics now, actually. But we, Tom, you really hands. We've got a question down here at the front. I can just see. Mike's Mike's just making his way. Oh. Hi, my name is Rajesh. I come from AppShift. So we are a mobile app and internet of things building platform. So workshops and events around that. So in terms of what you were talking about, with a big interest area for me is open data and data and in particular open data. So with digital, the big advantage, like even with an event like this, where you have to capture the data and then it can inform and become part of a collective wisdom. So I think that's the, the power, that there's no substitute for people yeah. as well. So I think that the two can work together. Yeah, that's, that's, I think it's a great, great point. And I'm just, I just want to make sure I'm looking over this side as well, so I don't ignore, ignore this side of the room. Um, 
Okay, so just quickly from my perspective, because obviously you know we've got got a pretty wide perspective on on the digital evolution of the industry at the moment, right? And I think the thing that surprises me is is the the massive gulf, right? So we see some amazing organisers completely pushing the envelope. They're they're, they're very on trend. They're you know they're, um, they're they're ahead of the digital curve. But then there is a surprising number of organisers out there that are still struggling with the concept of digital. And it's not not to be mean about them, but they've just not been educated um, as to the benefits or as to even how it works. And it still seems like. Uh, I think it's just a scary prospect. So we answer daily calls um, on things like, oh, I, I do believe we actually have to answer the question, how do I get online? Like, how do I open my browser? How do I get online? Um, through to, you know, how do I set up social media profiles? Um, you know, we still um, win a lot of business from people who, not from other ticketing or registration companies, but from people who are taking bookings over the phone, they're using Excel sheets and pen and paper to check people in, you know, like there is still a substantial amount of the industry that is not remotely digital. So I, I do think um, there's just a huge disparity. I don't think I, I don't think we can look at the entire industry, but I think there's lots of people who are uh, quite a way behind the curve and we need to do a lot to, to reach out to them and educate them. Um, but the thing is, if they're not on Twitter or they're not generally online, we can't reach them by blogging and tweeting, so maybe we need to, to figure out you know, some more uh, older ways, old school ways to, to reach those kind of um, segments of the industry. Um, hopefully through things like trade shows and events where you know, maybe they're a bit more comfortable to interact face to face. Um, but I'm, good. I'm just going to check. Uh, Mark, can I just yeah, uh, sure. take up on those points? Uh, Please. It's a great example of our company when we bought the trade show complex. Yeah. We're great um, advocates of face-to-face -face and you know, exhibitions and, and the power of doing the business face-to-face. -face. But we, we inherited with that deal over 100,000 contacts of data. And that produced, that was actually more valuable than the actual trade show. And the synergies that we got putting into the publications and then organizing other events and connecting people into our community was immense from that. And obviously, you know, there are regulations around that, but uh, it, it really, data is real power. And uh, we found that to us through the first half of the Okay, so how can we make better use of data as an industry? That's, that's the, the main point. Well, I, I think the first thing that uh, vendor organizers need to do is just they need to, if, if they have to invest in, in an app or invest in uh, analytics or tracking our leaders, I will always say go for the analytics first. Because you, you see a lot of organizers that you, you've asked them, okay, you get 100 people, you've got 1,000 people at your venue. Where do they go? <coughs> no one knows. And then I think that is an absolute key piece of information that the vendor organizers need to, need to know. So uh, investing in a, in a market automation tool, investing in, 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 in ensuring that everything is absolutely tracked, that the websites are enabled and collecting the, that specific data, that the cookies and everything is, is working in place, it will allow them to, to, to make better decisions in the future and therefore it will make them at some point you know to invest in, in an event apps and if they hook those event apps with 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 whatever systems they're using um that's um that, that's the way forward so what can they do about it they just really need to be open-minded you know they, they need to be open-minded there's again i i i talk from the point of view of business to business commercial event organizers and it's still uh, an element of they, they still don't know what that is, they still don't know what they need to know. Sometimes they need to know, should I invest in a, in a CRM tool or should I invest in a, in a, in a marketing automation tool? For you? And at this point in time, people are, uh, or CEOs of these organizations are, are within that debate. Is it a CRM or is it a, uh, a marketing system? Um, I will always say, go for the marketing system. Okay, I'm probably biased, but the reason why I always say marketing system is because it allows you to get insight of every single person that is coming to your website. And that is the very beginning of the journey. And then it takes trust everyone <coughs> further down the funnel. And then at that point in time, you are empowered with the, what Roger said with that data. So just invest, you know, it doesn't really cost a bomb to invest in a market automation system, you know, depending on the size of the data. So, uh, I would say that that's the, that's the very beginning. Just uh, stop using Excel sheets. A few things out. Uh, Paul, your, your sense of, you know, how can we encourage organisers to embrace a sense of open data? I think there is a willingness to do that, but I think there's also a confusion of 
compatibilities, you know, if I spend my budget on this, then does it embrace all stages through from uh, getting the data through registration? And you know, I know some of your own tools at Eventbrite are, are solutions across the board and that other companies uh, too. So I think it's important to make people feel as if they're buying something that's not going to suddenly be out of date uh, uh, down the line, you know, uh, better make the syndrome. Um, security is another uh, worry, of course, when you're collecting huge amounts of data. And of course, making sense of the data, um, it all depends on the, the abilities of the people who are who are looking at it. So I think you know there's a, a human investment required to make sure that that uh, the right people are, know what to look for within that data. Uh, to give another very concrete example from our own data, you know, we found that our show um, a, a great area to tap into was the PA market because a lot of personal assistants were booking events which we overlooked at Convex. So we decided, you know, we need that kind of data and we're looking for it and uh, I take the point about an online panel here, but we decided we need, needed a, a very successful uh, businesswoman to front up this, and we got Karen Brady, who had a great personal story, and that was all thanks to, to that kind of data profiling. But uh, you need to link it all up along the chain so that each, each bit of your technology works with the human qualities as well. Great, now I said. Well, it's very difficult for me because, um, in my experience, you've got, if you take the top 10 corporates almost in the UK, but most of them have got their own proprietary system that all come with their own knowledge. It's very difficult for us to, to get involved in that. I mean, it seems to me there's still a bit of a reluctance to download apps um, at conference. So, if I hear a lot of conference organizers frustrated that Delegate won't load the app, sometimes it can start with the Wi Fi not working terribly well, other times it can be people can't remember their. Apple passwords, and some people um, don't want to download apps. And as for open data, um, I don't think it's been adequately answered about what you're doing with that data, and are you collecting data for commercial gain? And that you know, if we, the delegates, load um, information onto that which you don't take and sell to third parties, and that's not necessarily what people are expecting or wanting. And I think security issues, you know, are getting wider. People are getting more wary about who they let on to their mobile phone. Is that, so I don't think that's been properly addressed yet. Just have two, two things, actually. I think um, the event organizers drive to invest in event apps is because sponsors want event apps, not because the event organizers in love it, because they can sell it. Um, that, that's kind of what I always hear, oh, we can sponsor the app, we can sponsor the app, because precisely they want to sell it, they want to, I can't even say gate crash, that's a total environment. But it would be interesting to hear from the people here, what is the most important piece of data that you want to know about the events that you organize and the people that attend? Is there anything you want to do? What, what, is the, what do why, you want to know? Why is that even there? What are they trying to get out of that? Yeah. Awesome. <coughs> why, why is that there? Anyone else? Any other? We do a lot of free events as well, but why do you go to the event? Is that your question up there as well? Someone's no, asked that was about my getting... question, but I'm down for one aspect. Okay, we, we will come on to that because I think it's an interesting one. But um, sorry, just for you know, I think what happens after the end of the work, we will follow up on sessions, communication, which you can measure that in the via social media or else. That'd be really helpful. Okay, anyone? Last one. I just, yeah, I just wondered if anyone had a good experience <coughs> of hybrid events because people who maybe stay at home might be encouraged to, you know, to log on and take part uh, remotely. Now, I know we've been talking about hybrid events for a long time, but um, there are very few case studies in relation to the um, to chatter uh, showing how that works. Although, you know, when they have put research questions, people say, oh, it doesn't hit the attendance of the live events. But I just wonder how many people are out there logging on. Yeah. Well, I've got a comment in the audience. Is that to this question? or? Yes. I think from, 
effective. You know, we've never seen organizers lose delegates or lose attendees from having a live streaming or a digital attendance option. Um, and I think it's a, it's a question that's been wrestled with by a lot of different industries. So in the States, a lot of the, the major league sports like baseball and hockey, like they were incredibly resistant to allowing uh, allowing the games to be streamed online. Um, I think at one point, probably even um, until they realized the commercial side of things, even on TV to an extent, because they thought they would lose their, their live event revenue. Uh, but actually what they found was the, the absolute reverse. And it's, again, this concept of fear of missing out because it's so much easier to then access what's going on. You just cannot replace that sense of being there, no matter how good the streaming capability, no matter how good the interactivity. So, you know, you, you can watch Glastonbury on TV now, right? You, know, you can see all the best, best performances. Does that stop everyone wanting to be there? Absolutely not, because you can't replace that, that experience. So from our perspective, then, it's a, it is a great opportunity and there's really on the upside. And, and there's gonna be a very, there may be a very small cannibalization, but it's gonna be completely offset by um, by the games that you have. Has anyone else got that experience? Um, yeah. Sorry, mic's fine. Um, hi, I'm Anna. I work at Microsoft in developer experiences, and we've run a lot of these kind of hybrid events. And to your point, making sure that we don't cannibalize the audience, we built it up really <coughs> slowly. So we started with just doing the in-person event and then doing on-demand content post-event. Then we went to doing it as a VIP opportunity. If you want to meet and greet the speakers, if you want to get on panel, if you want to demonstrate some of the stuff that you're building on your apps or do live coding demos yourself, bring people in that way. And now we've got an event called Tech Days Online that we run. Um, we've now got it so we have roughly 5,000 people streaming online over three days. And then we've also got about 500 people in the room. But it took us about four years of running it annually to build it up to that. So. It works, you just gotta do it slowly. I think if we went straight in with online only, we might not have built up the reputation of the in-person event. So let's move on to talk a bit uh, about marketing. I'm very conscious that we're, we're as I expected, somewhat overrunning on these issues. But it's good we're having it today. Um, so that for me, one of the, sorry, sorry. The, yeah, uh, my colleagues are on. Oh. <laughs> okay, so. Um, the, the survey revealed that event organizers find email to be the most effective form of marketing communication. I think 31% uh, of, uh, of all the respondents found it um, to be the most effective. We actually then did a follow-up survey of attendees to ask what their, how they discovered their last event. And they said, uh, 80% said it was by email, uh, some 47% said it was through Facebook. So there's definitely a disconnect there. Um, which, I, which I found particularly interesting. Um, so I'm going to pose, pose this original question to the panel and then I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at what we've got from the audience. But are we too reliant on email as an industry? And if so, how can we wean ourselves off it? And, and, and should we care? You know, if it works, should we care? So that's kind of three complex questions that I'm going to throw straight at Ricardo because. Okay, I would rely too much on email. <coughs> yes. Uh, does it work? Does it? Because 0.3% click-through rate in my own internal app, if you know that survey that I've done, you know, not, not any sophisticated, just asking people. 0.3% click-through rate to 0.5% click-through rate when you just literally plug your event. I personally, I don't think that's that's working, and I don't think the event organizers are reaching out know, to, to the best of their ability. What was the other question then, Mark? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, what 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 is the alternative? If, if okay. email. We we all uh, the reality is um, we don't have a short a shorter span to the whole fish right now. So the, the attention span is just just it just goes for a human being. So it's all on the user's terms, right? So what the user terms when I learn <coughs> about event rights, uh, you know, I try to look for that email that you sent me. I couldn't find it. What do I have to do? I have to go on Google and search event right, you know, uh, events. Or whatever it is, use it. When all of us want to use a product or service, we go onto Google and, and search for it. So the alternative is just to be there when the user wants to search for you. So that's where uh, creating content 
professional board, the element of content marketing, it becomes absolutely critical. The element of adding value before you plan your event becomes absolutely critical in that way of composition of uh, recording of videos or recording sessions, etc. So I think the answer lies on, 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 on that value that you added, and that links back to your uh, the results. So the, the first one was email, the second one was word of and the third one was uh, uh, social media, free social media. So how do you engage with social media? <coughs> Obviously through content. So that's the way the industry is moving uh, towards. And, and, and once you start emailing people not to push your event constantly, but just to add value, then beautifully email starts to perform in the way that you should. So then you start having click through rates and open rates, you know, click through rates of between 10, 20, 30% click through rates and open rates of 50. But then that means that you're not emailing tens of thousands of people, you're emailing fractions of individuals that have actually expressed an interest or through behavior of the collection data, you can deduct that they will be interested in hearing about your event. Thank you, Paul. Well, um, I think it's a question of, of how you use email, not whether email is good or bad, but uh, the kind of filters you have on there. Um, I went to a great talk at uh, IMEX where you know, there were 10 points, you know, how to filter your email so that you, you can get to the, the crux of what you need and what you're interested in. Um, interestingly, uh, one of our competitors in the video publishing market, the International Beauty Tribune, um, the editor there always says, oh Paul, you know, nobody's, nobody's going to be reading print or, or even websites, you know, you need videos. I said, well, how do you market it? He said, oh, by email. And it comes up a rather dull, dull email to click through to the videos. So um, I think it, it all depends on how it's presented. Um, but it's also a generational thing, you know, social media. Media, I think uh, it got 20% in it after the 39 percent And uh, you know, I would imagine that people would rise according to the impact of the millennial generation you are. Um, word of mouth, possibly the quality of that advice uh, would be like the 19% figure because um, I think if 19% of people tell you that, they're probably more evangelistic than 31% uh, telling you that email uh, that you know, uh, I think, um, you know, there are statistics and that statistics and yeah. And I still watch your case on Well we don't organise the so it's not we don't do it. But I mean from our own experience of um, I think click through rates much higher than, than you so I think it's it's brand, you know, if you your reputation for sending out interesting stuff that you're likely to get click through and then you've got a responsibility when they click through to show something interesting. Um, we've tried it at weekends, which is interesting, we get a high click through rate at weekends sometimes. Might suggest that, um, but it's not science, isn't it? It's, it's a whole industry in itself. Yeah. I mean, yeah. my take on it is is that if it works, then absolutely brilliant, right? You know, keep keep plugging away. But at some point, you you may find it doesn't work as effectively. You'll you'll reach a, a point of diminishing returns. So I do think you need to have multiple channels. Um, but to the point of how to do good email marketing, you know, there's a few key points. So ideally, don't be buying email lists. You know, they, they tend to be not as good quality. Um, actually, most email clients, and um, people like MailChimp, etc., won't actually let you add them. So, how do, how do you get how do you get people's emails in the first place? Is, is probably the most critical aspect of whether you're successful with email marketing. You need to get them to opt in. You need to get them to come to you and say, "We like your service. We like the idea of your event. We like what you guys stand for. We like what you talk about." Actually, do please email us and keep us in touch. You're going to obviously see much higher success rate, uh, which comes down to the whole piece around content marketing, as Ricardo said. And then you've got to test what works. So, what time of day, what day in the week uh, works most effectively for you and your email communication. Um, and then segmenting those emails. You know, we talk a lot about segmentation in, in email marketing, but do, do people really do it? You know, do you really understand your audience and how they differ? And do you send them relatively targeted messages um, that are going to appeal to them? Or do you just send bland kind of marketing, salesy messages? Um, you know, they're always going to be less effective and result in unsubscribes. So that's my, my quick take on email marketing. What can we do to get people to attend free events? Um, we know there's a big dropout rate. Um, I've, I've, I've definitely got some strong opinions on this, um, but I'm, I'll turn it over to the panel first. We'll go back down this end. So, Alistair, have you got any advice to people on, on increasing 
Yeah, yeah. I think the, the best one is charge them if they don't turn up. Um, <laughs> and, and the best way to do that I've seen is that when you um, when you enter, you put a credit card uh, number in and basically um, if you show up, no charge. Even if it's five quid, you can make the difference. And um, uh, apart from that, I think they have sort of restaurants do this the whole time. You know, if you get a phone call, if you get an email, if you get a text asking you to confirm your reservation, there's all sorts of techniques you can do it. I quite like iPad registration personally, so it doesn't look like a, no one in the audience knows whether people have turned up or not. Another small, small thing that I've seen used quite cleverly in lots of venues. Otherwise, I think the really uh, clever organisers know. They just know from statistics that 40, 50, 60 percent turn up. If you're going to do a, <coughs> an evening event, um, you know, I think the, the time of day it starts is critical because people sit in their offices and they might make a decision within half an hour whether they're going to go to your event or not, purely on the basis I've got to sit in the office for extra half an hour and can't be bothered. So I think the ones where we see turn up in the evenings are the ones that start a bit earlier, interestingly enough. And um, I think mornings, breakfast, like we've done today, is always tricky. You know, people have got priorities. We're intruding now at 10 past 10 into the work day. You know, I think if a responsibility to stop on time as well, that feels <laughs> whoops. Yeah. And Paul? Yes, I think um, uh, an element of co-creation as far as the organisers able to, so that uh, the agenda is is uh, shaped partly by the people who want to come. Uh, they therefore feel a bit more responsibility. Uh, I think also something on the day, maybe a, a charitable angle or some kind of extra piece in the jigsaw that they they would uh, get some kind of takeaways and that are, that are there, put very much top of mind before we, before we come. Uh, as well as the uh, peer pressure around the social media engagement beforehand so that uh, you'd obviously be missed if you, if you didn't turn up in, in person. Um, those kind of things. And Ricardo, and then we've got a, a comment there. Uh, I, I personally disagree with asking people for credit card needs to be like the user because ultimately the user's prerogative whether they want to attend or not. And the, the event organizing responsibility to inspire and delight the people to, to ensure that you want to turn up. So, uh, solutions to that is just literally work with your mathematical thing, you know, that 50% of them are going to turn out, so calculate that whenever you're doing your, your marketing. Secondly, um, if you, you need to uh, ensure that you, you create like a little mini campaign of making people kind of wanting to attend, then drinks work. <coughs> Again, it depends on your audience, but if you're, if you're adding an extra value, as, as Paul mentioned, any specific networking that they're going to be able to have or, or they're going to meet someone, uh, organizers use different tactics, a rock band or a <coughs> something, a raffle, or, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of various tactics, but the, the, the short answer is you, you, when someone signs up to attend your free event, um, just start a mini engagement campaign with that just to, to keep the buzz going. And I think that's again social media plays a massive, massive part. Um, there's companies now doing really interesting things with um, uh, Ingo and um, and uh, one, uh, Glee Inc. They're the two companies that like when you sign up to attend an event, then you know you, you can just link to your Facebook, you can link to your LinkedIn, and they you know, just literally amplify that. So I am more likely to attend. It's like when you were invited to a party, you know, to, and you go in. So if I'm going, then okay, I'm, I'm going to go. And all these little things help. So. Yeah, I, I think that's such a good point on me. You know, your job is not done when someone's signed up. You yeah. absolutely have to then create this campaign to keep them engaged and, and make them want to come. And I think one other point is just think about how you encourage people to sign up for the free event in the first place. So I would try and unless it purely is a networking event maybe where, where drinks and food is, is one of the main benefits and um, trying to shy away from the free stuff people get at the event and trying to focus on the value if that, if that makes sense so for example etc venues have laid on a lovely breakfast and free coffee for you guys today but i didn't mention that at any point in the marketing campaign to get people to attend i only spoke about that after people had signed up because I don't want people at the event just to get free breakfast and coffee. I want them to be here because they're interested in learning more about the future of events. Um, so I, th I think, you know, look at how you're actually getting people to, to come onto the free event as well uh, and try and try and meet the, the main value, the main reason you want them there rather than kind of the, the free stuff that you're going to give them. 
And do you still have a comment in the back, sorry? Oh, it's just I work for a charity and it won't make any difference. Um, <coughs> when you do free stuff, people don't value it in the same way as they do when they pay for it. Honestly, I think that's the truth of it. And I think um, you will always have that, you know, you will always have that drop out wherever you do. Th that is the truth of it. Like the best way to, to get, to reduce dropout rates at an event is to charge. It's just that simple. It doesn't have to be that you charge if you're not turned up. It could be a flat. Actually, this event has value. Please give me five pounds, ten pounds, etc. And it can go towards the cause. <coughs> you know, it doesn't have to be for profit still, but but absolutely. I mean, it, we mentioned the the uh, airline industry. Like that, that I find absolutely incredible. They overbook all their flights, even trans transatlantic flights that cost thousands, thousands of pounds, and they overbook by 10, 15 percent because people just don't turn up for flights after they've dropped thousands of pounds on it. Like that's crazy. You know, people just don't turn up for things. Um, you know, that's just reality, I think. And we had a, a comment here. I think the credit card details are quite interesting because I've done one before where I paid for the deposit and then on the night we've oh, sorry. Um, so on the night we've given the deposit back. Now, just because you've said in an email or in your campaign that some special person's coming or there's some value to it, you can't actually guarantee that until the evening that they don't get anything out of that. So if you give someone that at the beginning, you're like, take five pounds off you as an example, they've put that value into it, so they've then got that personal value of five pounds or whatever it is, and you know they're gonna get it back. So if it is rubbish on the evening, then they're gonna get it back and that's okay. And I think it was, I mean, I did an event where before we were getting really low um, attendance, and then I put a five pound deposit, I suppose it was a target market that I dealt with, which was students as well. But then it was completely packed, like we'd overbooked as well, and it was completely packed. So I think there is something in that, um, whether it's credit card, Thank you. So, uh, Richmond events. Anybody from Richmond events here? Anybody know the Richmond events model? If you sign up to a delegate there, it's free. If you don't go, it's 1500 quid. That's because, you know, you're going on board a ship or you're going to a conference. So, they've really, really pioneered that model and they absolutely nail their attendance. So, the more you charge, the more you'll know whether people want to come or not. Then they won't book themselves onto another event if you didn't if it wasn't good if it wasn't good enough. So right. I think you know, you know that that brand yeah. and that event is. And in that case, Richmond events have charged the sponsors eight thousand pounds each to meet these people. So it's a disaster for them. They don't turn up. So um, we've got a poll. We'll start with the, we'll start this with a poll so to get things going. So is there really a talent drain? And in fairness. This isn't necessarily something we found in the report. We actually just found in the report that people were, were looking to hire more, which is, is good news for employment and opportunities, but is there a shortage of talent in the events industry? Okay, I think there's a, a reasonably clear trend there that, that two thirds of people, oh, oh, hang on, late surge. Okay. Still in the majority that we don't think there is a, a talent drain. Um, but are we, uh, so let me start with the, the question uh, on here, the top one. Are we, are we fostering the right talent? And what drives me to ask that is um, in the report that the number one position uh, companies were recruiting for were, were marketing professionals, marketing and communication. Like by far and away, that was the largest number of um, open positions. Um, followed by sales, so very, very much um, top of line revenue driven positions. So, you know, are, do we have enough of those kinds of people coming into the industry versus maybe people more on the events management side and logistics and operations, etc., coming through event management courses? Um, Alistair, I'll, I'll start that one with you. Do uh, we have the right uh, I'm here? absolutely in the no camp here. I think it's a recruitment challenge. Um, and uh, you know, we are constantly looking for good people, and um, generally we're short of, 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 of the people that we like. But I just met on Friday with uh, six of the event management students who are doing a year with us. I thought they were the best group that I've seen. Um, it's very female orientated at the moment, which is has strengths and weaknesses. So I'd like to see more ironically male. Um, talent at the, at the bottom and, and slightly more female talent at the top. Um, 
but um, we've got good representation. I think it's coming through. So, and then I also balance that with, with other sectors that I think absolutely take um, the space. Uh, the, the gentleman down here is in the, the tech space. If you talk to them about talent and drain, oh my goodness, it's a huge, huge issue. Way, way, way beyond our sector. So it's all relative. Thank you, Paul. Well, um, I think on the plus side, we do have increasing event management faculties. Um, when I started 10 years ago in the industry, uh, people tended to just fall into this industry. And it often meant that you didn't get the best talent because people weren't making an informed choice. Um, on the other hand, the events management faculty did the same thing to the university. I think 80% of the students come from abroad and they have to pay a, a, a good amount of money, so they're obviously teaching them well. But um, they're then going back to China, to Brazil, to Russia, um, or working in international companies. So you do wonder where the homegrown talent is coming from. Um, if you take uh, my company's uh, publishing sector, exhibition sector, it's still very much people who started out somewhere else. You know, there was no problem recruiting sales people to return. There's no great pay differential, I would say, in that sector. But in terms of the ops side, um, you know, the, there is an issue of low pay in the industry, and uh, you know that's the elephant in the room, and I think it needs to be tackled. And, and so that uh, young people are, are not just choosing the glamour part of the events industry. Yes, I want to be a wedding planner or to work on the Olympic Games, but you know, you know want to go into the conference side where most of the jobs actually are. Um, but are we sending the right messages and, and showing them the paths of progression? Because I'm convinced this industry, like no other. Within a couple of years, you can really, you know, really very highly up the industry and, and reap the rewards then. But the entry points are very, very low paying, and I think that's a big problem. I, I think it is a very meritocratic very industry wide. Yeah. You know, people can buy quite a bit. Uh, I agree with that. Ricardo, what, what do you. Yeah, I think I'm in line with what you're on the service side, it's marketing, and uh, it's, it's, it's the big, I think there is a time frame. Um, not, not marketing professionals out there to serve the industry in the way the way that there's, there's a massive demand all companies are so anyone that's a marketeer is can just pick and choose the company that they want to work for uh, and then i think the problem uh, what i find within marketing as well is that like event students that study event management but not event marketeers and event marketing it, it is it's like a very specific it has a, a degree of specificity and you, you will need to, or companies will need to nurture these marketeers, and then that, that's that's when you know, if you look at the the big players, IIR, IQPC, Terrific, they they breed them, so they they have recruitment programs for them. Just people fresh from uni, and they just train them in, in, in how they want. And so it's probably normally a, a, a three six month training program. Um, so that is that is but that is a massive issue, and I don't see how it's that going to change. Um, and and the, and the biggest problem uh, that the uh, event industry has is that low pay, lots of hours, people are deserting in the industry, which is unfortunate. You know, mark, especially marketing, I can't speak from, from any other areas, but I'm sure for operations, for operations people, you know, but people are deserting the industry. So those that are staying in are, are kind of reacting to rewards, as you said, uh, and, 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 and people are living, so there's not enough talent. And that kind of leads to organizations doing crappy marketing and going back to the easy way of doing things because there's a shortage, there's no way of getting out that type of way. I, I, think, I think I agree with all, all of these points. And my, my personal take on it is that there's, there's clearly an increasing degree of professionalism, particularly around the event management side of things and, and the increase in education there. But I do think we're probably losing out um, to other industries when it comes to very specialized talent and people at the top top of their game. So, you know, if you're fantastic at SEO, you're probably going to go and work in online gaming or e-commerce. If you're um, if you're brilliant at tech, you're going to go and work, you know, development, you're going to go and work for a tech company, etc. And that then creates a divide because you've then got a lot of pe you know, people in the events industry who don't really understand those, those, side, you know, those professions and there's no one in the team to turn to to ask about it. Um, and so they're being sold to outside vendors who are pushing things forward, but there's a gap of communication. And that's why you know, maybe we're not pushing forward as fast and we're not adopting digital as fastly as 
as quickly as we might do because the, the, you know, we're focused on one side of things and then all the vendors are focused on the other. And I think it'd be great if there was a bit more crossbreeding. So, um, you know, more people who've worked in events go and work in tech companies and et cetera and, and vendors and more people who um, are great at these different specializations come and work for the events industry. I think that would be a, a really nice mix if we could achieve that. Or people who are already in the events industry get trained up on these specialisms. Um, I think, I think that would be a really nice place to see us go. Um, so I, I know we've got a bunch more questions on there, but let's let's go back to the audience and then and then we'll see if there's anything else on Slido to be able to do. Um, I just want to say a couple of points to that. So firstly, um, we do an event management course at the university I work in, and I think a lot of our students, the challenge that they have is they need a year's experience before they can get to the lowest job within the events industry. Now, where do they get that experience from? If they graduate and then they have to do an internship, often it's free or only and expensive and you're living in London. So how can we expect um, students to survive in London for a year and not being paid to get that one year experience? Um, but secondly, we're also, um, as we said before, it's a female driven industry and events management is hard and planning is late nights, weekends often. If you have children, then those people often go from the industry and we've definitely noticed that in our team. Um, because it's it's not very female friendly in terms of maternity and uh, those kind of things. So I think if we could get those two issues, maybe we'll keep people longer in in there, um, maybe after they have children, but also get people in at the bottom as well. They're great points, I think, really good points well made. And we've got another uh, question or comment over just past this pillar there. Uh, hi, um, I'd probably just like to add a bit of an observation as well. Um, I, I'm Australian, so I've spent part of my working life in Australia, and I, I've seen a definite um, difference in the industries and the ability to actually move and develop in your career, because it, in to, specifically in the UK, it's quite pigeonholed from what I've, what I've seen, and it, it's restricted in working across different segments of events. So if, if you start out in-house in corporate, moving to agency is extremely difficult because agencies are expecting four or five years agency experience, not four or five years event management experience. Let's have a discussion and see if your experience can actually match or if your personality matches what we're looking for in a candidate. There's an automatic cutoff. And and again, agency, or then if you're you're working in non-corporate that's still in-house, it's it's very pigeonholed and very restrictive, and I guess Ideally, I'd like to see a bit of a broader perspective or, or wider thinking from the recruitment side of things that you might not have that very specific six-year pigeonhole growing up experience that we're looking for, but actually you're quite experienced in what you do, so that's a wider conversation about that. So just a complete switch in industries that I've seen from different, different countries, really.